Hi and welcome. Good morning, everyone. This is Seek Sustainable Japan and our monthly, but we missed one last month, our monthly sub series、uh, short takes. Now, I'm JJ Walsh, based here in Hiroshima, Japan. and... Hi, I'm Tova Kinooka,、uh, usually based in Yokohama, but today I'm in Tokyo. Now we are catching up after a very busy and hot summer. Both of us has, have been to other countries and have ideas to bring back.、Uh, but you might notice my nails have a little tinge. So I just got back.、Uh, once I came back from Hawaii, I went to Tokushima and I had an indigo dye experience. So you can see、Ooh. some of the residue still from the indigo.、Um, but it was fascinating because I got to see. From growing the indigo plants to processing and fermenting the indigo, and then what happens with this place, they put it right back to the fields.、Um, so it was wonderful to see that like circularity, like so clearly in mind of the、yeah. person doing it. And、uh, so that was nice to see after being in America. We were talking about before we went live so many vegetarian options, vegan options abroad. And then when you come back, you're like, come on, Japan, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Any、Sorry、big takeaways、that. from your trip, Tova? You went to Europe, right? Yeah, so、um, we, we've just been looking at、uh, universities with my daughter. So we were in Austria,、uh, Vienna for a few days, and then、um, the Netherlands,、um, various places there, and then finally visiting family in the UK. So it was a really interesting opportunity to kind of look at、um, how sustainability is showing up there, just in sort of daily lives and, and the places we stayed and visited and what we sort of saw around us. And like you said, the food was a big one, right?、Um, The, the food, oh, that, that was Amsterdam Pride, the picture you're showing at the moment. We were just coincidentally there for Pride, which was amazing.、Um, and quite different because we, we've been to Tokyo Pride you know, many times. And so it was really interesting just reflecting on what was different. And I think when we see it in Tokyo, okay, it's sort of a newer thing here. And it's very kind of very much in a small area. And when you do the parade, it's just on this sort of cordoned off bit on the street and it's very sort of tightly controlled. Um, what you can do. And there it just felt like the whole sort of weekend、um, of the celebrations, the whole city was just absolutely buzzing.、Um, and, and yes, there was the main parade along all the canals with the boats. A lot of the, the boats there were 100% electric,、um, it said on the side, which was great to see.、Um, and one, one boat on the side of it said something like melting, melting discrimination, not, not、um, ice caps or something like that. Um, which was you know, really nice. But,、um, and quite then also, such a cycle friendly city, right?、Yes. Everything focused on the bicycles. Bicycles everywhere. So, this, these we loved. We saw many, many variations of these cargo bikes or bucket bikes. And we, we were sort of looking at how many different ways we saw them used. So, we saw, of course, people sort of taking their kids around in them. We saw dogs in them. We saw people with their shopping and, and you know, carrying stuff around. We saw one guy with what we assumed was his elderly mother、um, going along in the bucket、That's、bike. It's amazing. It's amazing.、Yeah. There were ones with hoods, there were just sort of open、yeah. ones. And a lot of Dutch people、uh, who come and I do tours for in Hiroshima, they often mention that it wasn't always a cycle friendly place, that it、right. was a big change、yeah. from a car central city like most of the world.、Mm. And、yep. then making the decision, the governor, government、mm. making the decision, no,、yep. we are going to be cycle friendly, making cycle friendly lanes, everything's、yep. very clear. You know,、yeah. it can be done. This is a great model for everywhere. Exactly. I mean, it, the, yeah, you mentioned the lanes, but also things like it's really easy to take your bike on the train. And the, the trains there, just sort of the big, you know, main trains going from city to city. All have sort of space for you to take your bike. So we saw so many people just hop on with their bike, hop、yeah. off at the next place, and then off they go on their and, bike. And same in Hawaii, you know, the transportation's、yeah. not great.、Mm-hmm. They just got their new rail going, yay, after yeah. 20 years.、Um, but any public bus, you can put your bicycle on the front of the bus. Yeah. So you can use your bicycle、yeah. all over the island. You know,、yeah. I mean, there are simple solutions we could put、mm-hmm. in place in、yeah. Japan as well. Yeah, no, that was really great to see.、Um, and a lot of sort of 
uh, electric assisted bikes and stuff as well. So it makes it easier if people, you know, do find it hard on a normal bike. So my yeah. knees are falling apart. I struggle with normal bikes, particularly yeah. if there's a hill, but that kind of thing takes that excuse away, right? It's like, yeah. oh. And then in yeah. Hawaii too, there was electric yeah. mobility. Mm. So uh, when you go to like, we went to the Waimea, Waimea Falls, Waimea Valley, and yeah. it's a very a beautiful place where you can learn about indigenous culture. You can see mm. the waterfall and they have electric wheelchairs that anybody who has mobility issues can use and go all the way up to the waterfall or you can use their electric service bus and uh, pay a little bit yeah, and go up in the service yeah. bus. So these are also things we need to think about in Japan with the elderly population and making mm. it more accessible, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There are lots of options out there. And I know one company we worked with last year, actually, in Tokushima, um, where you've just been recently, uh, was looking at um, could they repurpose um, the electric, uh, what are they called, golf buggies? Um, yeah. to help elderly move around kind of when they maybe are unable to drive in these rural areas, but there's no bus service or anything like that. They're like, we could use these things and they can follow a track. Yeah. Um, so interesting to see sort of what starts to happen. Absolutely. Um, and you problems. probably saw in Europe, I saw in mm. Hawaii, there is a boom in electric cars. Every yes. other car I saw looked yeah. like an electric car. There's charging yeah. places everywhere. But also, like you mentioned, the golf buggies, people yeah. who live in small communities are using these kind of golf buggies with license plates to get around short distances. I mean, why Fantastic. not? Right? Yeah. It was a yeah. good idea. Very practical. Very yeah. practical. We yeah. also saw these great, very simple water fountains in every park, uh, water places to refill. You've got a special one for your water bottle. You just fill yep. it up without touching anything, without having to get your, mm. your mouth next to something. So this is standard. It has been for a long time in mm -hmm. Hawaii and California and many other places. So yeah. this is a big issue in Japan. We still don't have places to fill up, right? Not enough, not enough. And I know my Mies were working hard to, to change that, but um, yeah, it would be good to see more availability of that, particularly with this heat. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Japan Times has had a new series. They started this year uh, all about the heat and uh, talking about all the problems with uh, not enough hydration. A lot of people are dehydrated already, and then you've got these high temperatures, hottest ever summers, and you're having a lot more heat stroke. All the problems that the ambulance services are having, the hospitals are having with all the people mm -hmm. coming in, and then cor correlate that with the higher electricity prices, people not using their air conditioning, a yeah. lot of elderly who live alone are dehydrated and, and heat mm -hmm. stroke at home. So yeah. something like encouraging having public service announcements, uh, hydrate, refill your bottle, yeah. Having these refill stations is a kind of public service announcement too. Oh, yeah. come and refill your bottle. Like not just, you know, people are feeling the crunch economically. You don't have mm. to buy a bottle of drink. Just yeah. refill and people drink more because it's free and available, right? Exactly, exactly. When you think sort of bigger picture and the, the positive benefits of that, like you say, for health services and things like this and easing the burden, then it does make a lot of sense to, to put that initial investment in. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I, I got really excited about while I was in Hawaii was seeing the Oahu Resilience uh climate change, sustainability, and resiliency office as part of the government. And they have a new initiative, which is coming into action mm. in 2025 in April, that all the green bins, which now you can put all your garden cuttings and yeah. uh, from the parks and everything, grass and leaves, but they're also going to add compostable containers. So all places that have takeout food, it has to be a compostable container. Brilliant. All takeout yeah. drinks has to be a compostable container. And mm. from next year, you can put that in the green bin and yeah. your kitchen waste as well. So really uptick mm. in what is accepted as recyclable. So they yeah. say now uh, they have only about 26% of their waste is recyclable. Mm -hmm. And so once they start accepting compostables, that's gonna go up probably about 30% more. 
Wow, so they that's brilliant. Have these yeah. clear targets by 2045, they want to be carbon yeah. neutral. So yeah. this is one of the ways they're moving forward. This is yeah. what we need to see happening in Japan too, right? Yeah, I would love to see, you know, the compostable part, I think, um, has a lot of benefits. I mean, we're lucky enough to have sort of a bit of outside space at home where we are that we can, um, you know, sort of do our own composting there. So I've had bokashi bins for, for years now there, which don't smell or anything. But what we've noticed actually is a, a sort of a side benefit of that is, our kit, our bin, our normal bin in the kitchen doesn't smell anymore because it used to, particularly in the summer when it's hot like this, right? If there was any food waste, namagomi as we call it in Japan, um, it would get really smelly. Like even a day or two, and you're like, oh, okay. Every time you open the bin, it's absolutely revolting. But that just doesn't happen anymore because there is no um, sort of namagomi in that um bin it's wonderful so it all just goes in the compost it goes outside um and inside smells a lot nicer yeah thanks mm. for for joining natasha once again great to see you and she says they have green bins in vancouver and i know when i visited nice. san francisco uh recology the garbage collecting service they have a big recycling bin and they do composting and the, he was saying mm -hmm. you have more value to sell back the recycling materials mm -hmm. when you separate out the compost because it's yeah. clean and then mm -hmm. you can get more money back from recycling centers when you're selling on the aluminum when you're selling on the paper cardboard right yeah yeah, no, it's been a lot of benefits that perhaps people don't see immediately, but um, yeah, it would, could be, would be good to see more of that. I'm sorry, I've got a cat joining the conversation in the background. That's <laughs> okay, okay, we always welcome cats in the conversation. We've got mine sleeping, sleeping yeah. on the newspaper behind. <laughs> Um, now, you also saw a bug-friendly uh, initiative. Where was this at? So this was in Kingston, just on the end, uh, edge of London, and they called it a bug hotel. So we were just walking to the station one day, and I saw this. And it's brilliant. I mean, it was taller than me. It's not hard, maybe, but, um, you know, sort of quite a, a, a sizable box. But it's just on a little sort of snippet of green in between a couple of streets um, where perhaps ordinarily there wouldn't be a lot of places for um, bugs to go and, and make their home. So here you've got, you can see there are lots of different sort of shaped openings on this. So it, it can be attractive to all kinds of bugs. So, you know, obviously bees and things, solitary bees, which like going in little spaces. Oh, some cats getting pretty noisy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, brilliant. Uh, and this is, this yeah. could be something we could add uh, in park areas in Japan. Yeah. Uh, we're yeah. having a big issue over the last 10 years yeah. of parks being completely concreted over because yes. people don't want to deal with the trees dropping leaves and yeah. it looking messy. And I understand that. Um, but we yeah. need parks with shade and trees yes. and healthy insects yeah. is healthy people, right? Exactly. But also a lot of the parks, I think, um, and, and beautiful gardens. I mean, there are some lovely ones in Tokyo. There are some lovely ones in London and Vienna and other places we saw. But um the the dead wood that sort of anything that's chopped down or fall, uh, falls down is often cleared away right but that normally um creates a habitat for a lot of bugs and without that they struggle it breaks the the you know sort of critical piece in their their life cycle if they don't have somewhere to lay their eggs or to to raise their um young so providing little things like this which doesn't take up a lot of space you can have them anywhere it can educate people around you know insects and what their role is um i think it's such a nice idea it's it's interesting it gets people involved and it um a space for the insects um you know to, to continue their life cycle absolutely yeah, very important uh, to protect our insects, something we don't think a lot about. Um, but I love that culture in Japan where kids go around in summer and they collect the beetles. And, um, you know, there there is that connection to education and insects and nature. And that's a wonderful thing about elementary schools in Japan. Right. So we need to yeah. keep that going on to adulthood. Um, now, yeah. one thing, I I was in Hawaii, so on August 6th, usually I go to the Hiroshima Day uh, ceremony in Peace Park, but since I was in Hawaii, I went to Pearl Harbor, and I, I wrote an article on Medium about it. I did a podcast about it because 
it was really impactful. And a lot of visitors to Hiroshima, they talk about Pearl Harbor, the attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese and mm. Hiroshima as a consequence of that by getting the Americans in the war. So there is that connection in a lot of people's yeah. minds. And it was really nice to go on August 6th. And then we saw there was a light up uh, ceremony happening the next night. And so we went back and they have this new sister historical Peace Park initiative between mm -hmm. Hiroshima and Pearl Harbor started by the ambassador to Japan and Hiroshima's mayor. And so mm -hmm. they're starting to have these commemorations about Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Pearl Harbor. And it just it's so positive and it's yeah. a good step forward because the more we talk about each other's history and connect as people yes. trying to understand yeah. each other that's that's the way forward right that's yeah. wonderful yeah yeah very much and, and on a similar vein when we were in um austria my i was there with just my my daughter um looking at unis and we went to this place mauthausen um memorial park which is a former concentration camp so it was the last concentrate or nazi concentration camp to be uh, liberated at the end of world war ii um and it was fascinating i mean obviously it's not a sort of a happy fun place to go but it's incredibly powerful and i was really pleased to go there with my daughter who's uh, 18 tomorrow so just at an age where she um is going out into the world and these lessons um that you know, can, we can learn from these places are so important. Um, and I was so impressed with the way they were using it as well. So it wasn't just sort of walk around, look at pictures, see where things happened. The guide went around with us and we were in a small group and he was really sort of, he'd get to a, a sort of part of it and he'd say, okay, what do you think this was used for? Um, and so for example, outside the walls, it was on top of a hill, really beautiful area um, with the river down below. And just outside the walls, there was a football pitch and he said, OK, so, you know, who do you think played football here? And it turns out it was the, the guards from the concentration camp had a professional team and the people from the village used to come up and watch this. Um, and he said, well, why do you think the people from the village then were happy to mix with the guards? Why do you think they didn't say anything? They could see the other side of the barbed wire just at the end of the football pitch where they had the really sick people who were basically just sort of left to die. Um, why do you think with this going on that they felt it was okay to come watch a football game and didn't say anything. So it was really interesting to kind of reflect on what drives people to do things like this and why people do or don't speak up and things like this. So we, um, it was quite a mixed group that we were with. It was really interesting to hear people's opinions there. And what was also brilliant was um, the guide says he spends a lot of his time working with school kids because every school child in Austria has to go to, a, not sure just Mauthausen, but one of these concentration camps as part of their education and learn about what happened and say, this is our history. This is something we need to know about and not repeat. And there were also groups of young military personnel there who also come through. Um, so it, it was really interesting to see how they were really leveraging this, being very open about you know, the mistakes of the past and not carrying that forward and not pointing fingers and blaming, but saying these these were people who were following orders, you know, how could they do this? And then they go home to their families afterwards. They were people like you and me. How does that happen? And how can we avoid that happening again? So it was really, really interesting to reflect on the psychology of yeah. it and to understand what drives behaviors and to, and to, to own to own what happened in yes. your country's past in a very, very humble much. way but yeah. to move forward and hope mm. it doesn't happen again that's kind yeah. of the philosophy of yeah. hiroshima as well but yes. i was really impressed when we went to pearl harbor i was impressed by the the guides who were preparing us before we mm -hmm. went to the arizona memorial and the guides would say now remember where you are Mm. get this sense of place. This is not a tourist attraction. Yeah. This is a yeah. memorial. This is where yeah. so many people died. And mm. so taking these ideas for when I do tours in Hiroshima and mm. trying to maintain that respect yeah. and that sense of place and the ownership of what happened. Mm. I mean, Pearl Harbor, as well as Hiroshima, maybe there's not enough ownership of mm. what your country did yeah. at that time or yeah. right. So in Pearl Harbor, there was just a tiny section about Hiroshima and Nagasaki as a 
-hmm. as a way to end the war. That's really yeah. how it was written. Like nothing mm -hmm. about how many people died. But in Hiroshima, yeah. are we honest about what happened in Pearl Harbor as well, yeah. right? So yeah. this is a nice way to see how they have a collaboration and yeah. hopefully can move forward with a mm. more honest discussion because that, that matters for the future, yeah. right? Very much, very much. Yeah, be, I was really impressed with the approach and it sounds like, you know, sort of really good things happening in Pearl Harbor there as well. And I would love to see this reflected more everywhere in the UK, more, you know, if I think of what I learned about history growing up, there was nothing about a lot of the darker side of, of British history, say. And I think, you know, it would be really, really good if we could like you say, take ownership of that and learn about it, and then hopefully, not yeah. not repeat those mistakes moving forward. But the fact that mm. these are tourist sites as well, yeah. and these are often the top places to visit. Yeah. But we have to prepare mm. visitors to yeah. be mindful of where they are and have respect mm. because people come here to pray for people who died, and and mm. horrible dark events happened here, and it's mm. not just Disneyland, right? Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's a really important way to, but it's it's not just the tourist fault. We have to have guides. We have to have a way to prime them for that yeah. mindful experience, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Now you had uh, switching gears. Uh, you had uh, Enteleco, uh, you finished your report. Tell us a little bit about this. Finally. Um, so we had an event back in March um, looking at the sort of connection between HR's uh, role and sustainability and how HR can get involved to sort of drive the embedding of sustainability into organizational culture. It was a great event. We had speakers from SK Group, Userbase, Unilever, um, NN Life, uh, who am I forgetting, IKEA. Um, really great bunch of companies um, and the report was written quite some time ago and then we had to sort of obviously get all the approval from all, all the speakers companies um, and then things were just incredibly busy and we didn't get around to getting it out so finally it is out you can have a look at it on the website download it um, and what we would love is that people download this read it think about what they're seeing there the different examples from the companies involved um, and then use that to kickstart conversations in their own organization organizations and think about, you know, if you're an HR person or somebody involved in sort of organizational change, um, how can you use that sort of leverage point to, to embed sustainability into your company? So please take it away and use it. Um, and we'd love to hear how you get on. That's fantastic. I'll put the link, of course, below in all the show notes, but I'm, I'm just adding it now for people oh, who are watching you. live. Uh, yeah. to check out as well. That's wonderful to hear. It's, of course, it's about governance, it's about what consumers can do, mm -hmm. but it's also definitely about what companies are doing, what companies can do. So yeah. these kind of events really make a big difference. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. It's great. Natasha's uh, last comment about uh, in Canada also, we need to mm -hmm. be more honest about indigenous, how the indigenous uh, people were treated. Yeah. And uh, yeah, definitely. We need ownership of the mm. past all yeah. over the world, for sure. Thanks for your yeah. comments. Yeah. And maybe just adding on to that point, so Natasha, it was great to see that comment. Thank you. Because um, we've just kicked off our annual um, sustainability entrepreneurship program with working with young leaders um, for one of our clients. Um, and we will be going to Montreal in Canada um, next month in a couple of weeks time for the, the annual One Young World Summit. And every year the summit, there are sort of five uh, key themes, plenary themes. And one of them this year is Indigenous Voices, um, which of course in Canada is recently, you know, a very important, very uh, public issue. And we're working with our um, delegates here last week in a workshop to look at sort of what areas of interest they have across these five different um, sort of core themes and what they want to take on a project with, which they then have to pitch um, to their senior leaders at the end. One of the groups has chosen Indigenous Voices, which actually we didn't expect because it's not something you hear people talk about a lot in Japan. So we were quite surprised to hear them say, yeah, this is something we're really interested in. We want to know more. We want to do something about. So I'm really pleased to see that. I'm looking forward to seeing what we learn in Canada, from Canada, about their experience with this. Um, and of course, you know, how we can bring that back to Japan because there are indigenous voices here who are 
um, marginalized and not not heard or supported. So um, absolutely, yeah, looking yeah. forward to, to getting into that. Oh, that's fabulous. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, recently, I since I came back, I had a chance to talk with Douglas Brooks. Uh, I talked to him before, but this time we were following up and talking more about his documentation of traditional Japanese wooden boat making in Japan. And he's doing projects around the world. He was in France at a boat maritime festival making a Japanese boat and next to him was a Japanese team. He didn't know it was gonna be there. He's hired to go to Spain to do Japanese Okinawan style boats. Um, so he's really keeping the culture alive from mm -hmm. his base in America, yeah. but teaching it to his students, uh, studying mm -hmm. with artisans and craftspeople here. So it yeah. was wonderful to talk to him. And then visiting Tokushima, there mm -hmm. were so many connections to that and how a lot of the craftspeople, like here you see traditional oh. uh, Japanese style, uh, beautiful umbrellas. They're mm -hmm. still making at the workshop there. Uh, in this town and it was wonderful to see, but they're saying the same thing you hear all over Japan. We do not have apprentices. We yeah. are not teaching this in the schools. Mm -hmm. um, so you're on the verge of losing all of this yeah. culture. And mm -hmm. I, I see this over and over in Japan. Yeah. Um, but then we also visited a show you maker and a young guy is taking over the family business and keeping the traditions alive. Oh, fantastic. And so that was great to see. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Tokushima, they're also really active for their famous ama dancing. I heard you had it in uh, Awa Odori in Tokyo recently, right? Yes, um, yeah, it's that so there, season. There isn't are it? some, some mm. positivity about how we can keep culture alive. How yeah. can we keep um, these things that we hold dear as part of mm. Japanese traditions and culture? Yeah. Um, but we have to have the education. We yeah. have to have people making a living doing it to mm. keep going, right? Exactly. It can't be just a hobby, otherwise people can't keep going. But I mean, connecting back to the indigenous voices, right, there's so much wisdom in a lot of these traditional crafts and, you know, the, the techniques that they have and often very circular and sustainable as well. Um, you know, it, there's a lot we can learn. So to lose it, not only be sad culturally, but I think we're, we're losing potentially a lot of, um, you know, techniques, a lot of wisdom, a lot of um, things that we could be using going forward to sort of make our, our lives more sustainable now. So, uh, yeah. Uh, one, one highlight of the trip I was so glad to see uh, was the puppet making culture oh, wow. in uh, Tokushima is still very much alive and very active with women. So many huh? women from young uh, students at school learning how to do the puppetry uh, <laughs> to the older women who are the mentors to mm. middle-aged women who are going around house to house with the puppets, keeping the traditions of blessing yeah. houses and people mm. alive and like the puppets touching them as part of the blessing. I mean, it was just fascinating yeah. and still so vibrant. And yeah. they mm -hmm. had an American uh, university professor who came over and was documenting and got so interested in it. He's now teaching at Tokushima University, helping them with the subtitles and everything. So it was like, yeah. you need that outside inside enthusiasm. Yeah. You need tourism. You need the experts and the academics from outside to come in and show that this is worth preserving as yeah. well as you need people here. You need both, right? Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's a great example. Wonderful. <laughs> it was so fun to see all of these puppets they control with three people. So it was absolutely fascinating to see how yeah. they do it. Yeah, it was really cool. Well, and when you think about the potential lessons from that for on, on teamwork, on collaboration, it's about storytelling, which is, you know, such an important part of getting people on board to, to make changes and, and things. So um, there, there's a lot to be learned from that. Yeah. And there's a lot of tradition. We were just talking about how Hawaii is making incentives to have compostable containers. Mm. But one exciting thing I also saw in... Oh. 
<laughs> How gorgeous is that, right? And this is traditional Japanese uh, bento box, which yeah. is reusable. So mm -hmm. wouldn't it be such a great local and visitor appeal if we had shops in these areas who were actually selling bento? Uh, would you like it in the reusable container? You pay a thousand yen deposit. And then yeah. you bring it back when you're done. Like, let's use what's already here, which is beautiful yeah. and high value. You know, yeah. so that was great to see. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, better wonderful. than compostable, right? Reusable is always better. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, lots of positive examples. That's good. Yeah. That's good. And then uh, hotel chain. Just one last mm -hmm. uh, thing I was excited to see. Uh, so that was a Daiwa Roynet, a vegan friendly, vegetarian friendly uh, breakfast buffet. I was able to have a lot of variety of foods. They were making their own tofu as well, Ooh, uh, which nice. is a, a local yeah. product uh, in Togushima. And mm -hmm. it was lots of plant-based proteins. Um, so you felt full, you felt satisfied, tasty. Uh, we need more of this. So it was great to yes. see. Yeah, oh, good to see. Well, that is our 30 Minutes Tova. We talked about a lot of topics. Um, <laughs> great to catch up. And we'll do Likewise. it again next month, I hope. Brilliant. Yep. Looking forward to it. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And have a great day.